Hello and welcome to this presentation on controlling vibration with tuned mass dampers and tuned absorbers. Now this is the abbreviated version of the presentation. It is intended to be educational. You know, hopefully you will gain something from this presentation, but I will be doing a much longer version uh, at our IMVAC conference in Belgium, Antwerp, Belgium on the dates you can see there, the 4th till the 7th of June, where I'll be delivering other presentations and there'll be lots of other great presenters. I'll also actually be presenting it in Australia and in the United States as well at the IMVAC events. So, as I say, this will be educational, but I won't be telling the whole story, otherwise you wouldn't need to come to the conference. And at the conference, obviously, you can ask some questions as well. So, as we are all aware, vibration can be a problem, and the vibration may be due to resonance, or the vibration just might be due to you know, some unbalance, or the vibration from an engine, or whatever. So, there are a number of solutions. You know, we may be able to detune the, uh, the natural frequency to, to change, uh, well, change the natural frequency and, and therefore it may not be excited any longer. And of course, we can try to balance the machine or we can even use isolation so that the vibration is not transmitted through the foundations. Um, but sometimes there is vibration that's just higher and uh, than we desire. Uh, we, we can't control it, so we need to do something about it. And the solution is, or another solution is, to use a tuned mass damper or a tuned vibration absorber. Um, they're very similar to each other, but there is a difference, and so I'll explain that. These devices are used in all sorts of applications. You've probably got some in your car and didn't know it. Uh, sometimes this suspension bridges sway. They're used. They're used in ship vibration to, um, uh, sorry, in ships to stop vibration either going through the hull and particularly in military applications so that they make less noise for buildings because of the sway due to the wind and. Uh, due to earthquakes, power lines, and of course in rotating machinery applications, and lots more. They're really quite a versatile application. So the basic idea is we're going to take a single degree of freedom system, which simply means it's a, a spring and a mass and probably a damper, it just depends on the application, and we're going to add it to the structure so that it vibrates and the structure involved no longer vibrates, or let's just say vibrates at that frequency at a much lower amplitude. And so there's an, an example of one that was added to a generator to stop some vibration. And here one, actually it's a different sort of generator. It happens coincidentally to be another generator on a ship. And this little thing vibrates up and down, uh, the tuned absorber. So technically, a tuned absorber, sometimes called dynamic absorber, sometimes called a tuned vibration absorber, and that's what I'll call them from now on, is, just a des is designed just to absorb vibration, not from resonance. So again, it's just a single degree of freedom system we stick on a machine, but we tune it, for example, to the running speed of the machine or something like that. A tuned mass damper does um, tune out the vibration. When I say tune out, it's there to counteract the vibration due to resonance. And it will probably have some damping, but not necessarily, to also dampen the vibration. Um, so here's uh, a little video that sort of shows it. Here we've got another single degree of freedom spring mass system with a forcing function. In this case, we've got an imbalanced mass which is being spun. Uh, although we're spinning it with fairly significant vibrations, it's not moving much because we've got a tuned spring mass dampener right here. So his resonant frequency is exactly the speed that we're spinning at right now. So Bob, the maintenance man here, can stand on the top of the uh, building with the imbalanced air conditioning unit and not experience too much vibrations. If we spin it at a different speed, I'll adjust the speed now. Now you can see there's much more significant vibration at the top of this because we're no longer operating at the resonant frequency of the tuned mass damper. And here you can see we're very far away from the tuned frequency and we're getting significant vibrations of the building due to the imbalanced mass. Okay, so the video actually goes on further, you'll see it at the conference, but you saw the main point. So from a modeling point of view, if you like, you know, if this was my single degree of freedom system, if I have a tuned mass damper, I tune it to the natural frequency 
And if we have some damping as well, that's the final response. So this is our resonant situation, and, and here's the final situation. We added a single degree of freedom system to our, what is essentially a single degree of freedom system, and we end up with two natural frequencies, um, you know, which sort of, it's like splitting the, the critical. And in this case, this is our dynamic absorber or vibration absorber, um, and it's just at a different frequency, but we still need it to overcome the vibration that we see there. This is a sort of a blow up of the area uh, that we were looking at before. There's the original natural frequency that could be excited. Um, if we simply add the mass and spring, but no additional damping, we get this sort of a relationship. You know, it's two criticals on either side of the, when I say criticals, just two natural frequencies uh, on either side of the frequency we were originally concerned about. Um, and if we add some damping, we get a, a, a better response. It's actually, um, if we were operating the machine at exactly this speed, then we don't need any damping because we get a you know, very low response. But if there's any variation in speed, then we add some damping as well. So to truly understand these things, and just to sort of help with your understanding of natural frequencies and resonance and, and all this sort of stuff, um, there's a little bit of theory. I'm trying not to make it too scary. Scary is not the right word, but anyway. So basically, you know, we know, hopefully, you know, if I've got a, a single degree of freedom system without any damping in this case, uh, you know, away it goes and it's just going to keep going. If I add just a little bit of damping and I do the same thing, then the vibration will dampen out. That's a fair bit of damping and of course I can adjust the stiffness and so on. But that's just a single degree of freedom system. Now this particular animation actually just takes a little while to load, but I can also then say, well, what if I have that single degree of freedom system, which is how we are modeling the structure which is resonating then I can see what happens, you know, as we get closer to the natural frequency, as I excite this, and, you know, we get to the natural frequency, so we get a lot of motion, but the motion, there's this 90 degrees phase lag, and that's, this is sort of an important part of the understanding. We can look at also the, um, the resonant response, you know, the phase, and the, um, the magnitude response, we can change the damping. Um, and look, this isn't all supposed to be just some super theoretical thing. There's going to be lots of practical stuff coming that you'll see. But it really helps just as a refresher or, or anything else to just understand what it means by the damping ratio, the percent critically damped, and what the relationship is between stiffness, mass, and the natural frequency. Um, and this is just a blow up of the area we saw before. I'll explain that more later. Now this is also a you know, potentially complicated equation, I suppose, but when we consider a dynamic system like this, we consider the combination of sort of three forces, if you like. The uh, stiffness by displacement, the damping by velocity, and the inertia or the mass by acceleration. So there's acceleration, velocity, and displacement. Um, so if it's a single degree of freedom system, we have one source of stiffness, viscous damping, I'm just modeling here, and, and mass. A multi-degree of freedom system is made up of, um, well, multiple sources from a modal point of view of stiffness, damping, and mass. Each of the natural frequencies uh, has its own modal mass, stiffness, and damping. And so if we do a driving point measurement, which I'll demonstrate in just a moment, we can actually figure out what the modal mass is of the structure that we're dealing with. And we need to know that so that we can properly design our tune mass damper. Now, the idea of this little presentation, particularly this abbreviated version, is not so that you can walk away and design one, but at least you know all the parameters and it's something that you can sort of go ahead and, and do. So if we look at a frequency response function, where in this case we've got acceleration versus frequency, this is called accelerance or inertance, and this part of the curve is basically one on M, the mass. We can figure out the modal mass from this measurement. We can get, um, there's our uh, uh, damping, and if we go to um, 
displacement versus frequency, which is called compliance or flexibility or receptance, there's our stiff. This is our stiffness control region, mass control region, damping control region. Anyway, we can just do a test like this. We hit the impact hammer right next to where we've got our response sensor. That's a, called a driving point measurement and we can determine all that information. So even though the systems we're dealing with will in reality be multi-degree of freedom systems, we can just treat the natural frequency uh, that we're dealing with as just a single degree of freedom system. You know, if we looked at actual test data, we see there's a natural frequency here, a natural frequency, a natural frequency. But if this is the one being excited, we're just going to treat that one as a single degree of freedom system. Now, from a modal analysis point of view, now this is going to look complicated, but I really think it helps to understand modal analysis, mode shapes, and everything else. And like I say, in the presentation, we'll just take a bit more time to explain this. But basically, each mode, whether it's the beam, here we've got a beam, you know, uh, bouncing up and down, like looking like a diving board almost, flexing or doing, you know, this mode here. Each one is a sort of a different set of, you know, mass, stiffness, and damping, and we can model all that stuff and figure it out. Anyway, when we're designing our tune mass damper, um, we can design it to either minimize displacement or minimize acceleration. We can find out the solution that we want and design it accordingly. Um, we can also make design decisions so that the system can cope with a bit of speed variation, either the excitation frequency, if you like, or we can cope with slight changes to the natural frequency. And particularly if we're dealing with structures like buildings and so on, where temperature and aging and so on can alter that natural frequency, we'd like a solution that um, sort of lasted longer. And then particularly for the simple sort of um, tuned mass dampers we might design, we've got to think about the fatigue failure um, of something like that. It's going to sit there and vibrate for a long time and could fail. So. Now, in the presentation, I'll go through this in more detail, but basically here is the structure we're dealing with. It's a single degree of freedom system. There's that modes, stiffness, modal mass, and modal damping. And we're going to add our single degree of freedom system to it, our little spring mass damper, with its stiffness, damping, and mass. And so, you know, whereas this was vibrating a lot, this is going to vibrate and this is going to vibrate less, but we can determine well, how much is this going to vibrate, what's the fatigue, how much displacement is there, is that a problem, and so on. So because I'm going to show just a few equations, you know, they are the parameters I'm using in the equation. Because we can, for example, determine what the mass of the tune mass damper should be relative to the modal mass of the structure we're trying to impact. And we come up with this convenient little ratio of the tune mass damper mass and the modal mass. And look, I, I can't go through all this stuff in this short version, but we, we look at that ratio and based on that ratio we get a different response, a different sort of width you can see here, like how much speed variation it tolerates and what sort of output we get, how, how it looks from a displacement point of view versus an acceleration point of view. So we'll explain all those much more in the presentation. Um, the other interesting thing is that with a tune mass damper, we actually don't tune it exactly to the natural frequency of the structure we're trying to improve. We actually detune it a little bit. There's that ratio I talked about, and so that's the frequency that we set up. And this is the damping uh, that we would need to use, depending on whether we want to minimize displacement or acceleration. And there's some other equations. So ultimately though, with the sort of thing that um, sort of tune mass damper that we might create, you know, we'll have a, a beam and you'll see a picture of one in a moment. In fact, you saw one earlier. Um, and there's our source of stiffness and some mass. And then a mass, which is, well, our source of primary source of mass. And as you can see, as I'm sliding this back and forward, it changes the natural frequency. And so we can design this to be approximately correct, install it, and then make slight adjustments to minimize the vibration. Um, and then we can compute from that, knowing how much vibration there will be um, and the material properties, we can figure out if there's going to be fatigue failure and what we want to do about that. There are also systems I'll just briefly mention that actually control dynamically the 
damping and stiffness uh, to adapt to different uh, conditions. Now, tune vibration absorbers, I'll, I'll talk about those in just a little bit of detail, but it's really just the stiffness and the mass. It's just got to overcome the dynamic stiffness at that particular frequency, and that may take a bit more uh, stiffness um, in order to achieve that and sort of more force. Anyway, so let's have a look at some examples. Here's a reciprocating compressor. It vibrates side to side and back to front. There's actually two natural frequencies there and it uh, took two tune mass dampers to solve it. Here we've got a, a marine diesel generator that we actually saw just a little earlier but you can see that originally the vibration was quite high and it dropped down quite low by adding this. Um, there's actually four of them. Here we've got a control room that sits up on top of a structure and the operators sitting in there just said oh this thing just sways back and forward and it was making them feel ill. So they said alrighty let's look at the vibration and there's vibration from pumps and the agitator and the floor and so on but the sway was the thing that was getting them. Three and a half hertz just the whole building just swaying from side to side. So, and you know looking at so the machines are making the structure, the whole structure vibrate and them sitting up on that control room, this was the vibration sort of over time just depending on what the root cause of the vibration was but the vibration was three times higher than what it should be for human comfort. So they modeled the whole thing, looked at the natural frequency at about three and a half hertz and designed these three pendulum systems with damping incorporated into the joint um, we'll talk more about this in the in the presentation but so there's a little model they created just to test it with damping in the joint and there it is in reality and it brought the vibration way down into acceptable limits and they all lived happily ever after here's another tune mass damper system and the vibration dropped quite a lot and here's um, a situation where this great big uh, generator, you know, steam turbine generator sitting up on top of this floor because it was susceptible to earthquakes. But wouldn't you know it, it had a natural frequency of 100 hertz and in New Zealand that's twice line frequency and there was a lot of vibration there, 18 millimeters per second. I need to put that in, well it's in Europe so it's okay. Okay, so there's the structure and that was the solution. So a lot of vibration on that thing and it would fatigue fail so they put the little straps on it and has a maintenance task replaced it every now and again. In a football stadium the stadium used to bounce up and down as the supporters jumped up and down so these um, tuned so there's the mass there's the stiffness and there's the damping stop the stadium floor from bouncing up and down that's the old stadium here we've got um, these little thing called Stockbridge dampeners or dampers because with the wind shear across the uh, cables you get this sort of vertical vibration which uh, it's damaged the cables so it's not the main sway of the cable it's just in fact I showed on the next slide um, just that vibration so that was the solution. In this case we've got Taipei 101 and because of typhoon winds and earthquakes the th building would sway back and forward and um, potentially catastrophically in the case of earthquake. So this you know 730 ton uh, ball was mounted in the building basically like a pendulum with dampers attached <laughs> And the video of it's quite interesting watching it. Someone was happened to be videoing it when an earthquake came. But this is before they installed it with an earthquake, a, a lesser earthquake. It vibrated enough that it caused the crane to fall down on some cars, unfortunately. So, tune mass dampers, um, they are designed to counteract resonance, whereas tune vibration absorber just counteracts vibration. And there's some references there as well. So, look. Thank you for listening to this presentation. This is obviously a shorter version, even though I can't help myself and it took 20 minutes. But I hope you found this useful. I hope it whet your appetite and maybe it would encourage you to come along to the conference. I'll be um, giving a number of presentations both in Antwerp and in the Gold Coast in Australia and in Orlando in, um, in the United States, in Florida. So I really hope to see you there.